as the wind blows the sounds of the song across the mountains. April lifts a cross of her own from her neck and places it briefly against her lips. He wearing yours, she asks me. And I lift it out from the front of my uniform to show her. She nods. Keep it on. We should be fine, she whispers. Though I gotta admit, it's nerve-wracking having somebody new here. Changes the dynamic a little. The balance. She moves into position against the little wall on the edge of the roof. And with a grunt, she hoists up a mechanical contraption of some kind, connected to the outpost itself. The thing clanks into place. It looks like a mix between a battered old spotlight and an M4. What is that music? I murmur. April, come on, what is happening? How does the song sound to you? She asks me, staring down the side of her curious weapon. Does it sound good? I consider, heart pounding. I can't make out the words, but the cadence to them. The language. They sound ancient. The tones fade in and out. Layered, liquid in their fluidity, from deep, low rumbles, to higher-pitched melody, male, to female, and back. Yeah? It does. I reply. It sounds good, and although it scares me, this song, I cannot deny its beauty. I try to work out the source of the music amidst the mountains. You're trying to work out where it's coming from, aren't you? April says in the pause. Yeah, I just. That's how it starts. And you just want to get a little closer to hear it better. Next thing you know you just have to go and find the singer for yourself. And then, then you never come back. April clenches her jaw. Give it a few days. The song loses its appeal. Approaching, comes a sudden, sharp voice through the darkness. Charlie, it must be. My right. And so, the night begins. With an almost impossible speed, April hauls her amalgamated weapon around with a mechanical clank and it slams into place. She takes quick aim, and I am treated to the sight of this weapon in use for the first time. It's quite something. I am forced to shield my eyes as an intense and fiery blast of immediate. Controlled light is sent rocketing out from the weapon's barrel. This is no spotlight. This is an intensity beam the likes of which I have never seen. It sparks with dangerous. Crackling energy as the beam is sent like a laser out and down towards the abyss. Pushing aside the remaining traces of mist as if blown with a great breath. Jesus. I shout out loud as the beam is swung round to the left. I cannot help but remember the enormous rifle attached to the outpost's roof. The one I saw when I first arrived. And I wonder if its effect is the same. And if so, what the purpose for such a monster of a weapon could possibly be? April pulls down on a lever attached to the contraption's side. And she launches the beam again. Little crackles of electricity jump between its gears as another sphere of light bursts from its barrel and screams down into the darkness. I blink as quickly and as rapidly as I can, doing my best to dispel the streaks of color that now dance across my field of vision. Through this kaleidoscope of confusion, I see to my horror a shift in the shadows far beneath, like living wind. It snakes and slithers from stone to stone as it approaches, deep down below. I shout in alarm, April, and in response the weapon is swung around and angled down. And again the light is sent tearing into the abyss below with a high-pitched electric scream. The rippling wind is obliterated into shards and little dark shapes, too far down for me to see what they are. But they rattle on their way back down the mountainside as they fall. Like lightning, the lights burn and flash all around me now. My hair is whipped away from my head in the wind. And it feels as if I am in the eye of some terrible, twisted storm. The beams from Charlie's position are clear. And I see lights fire out from the tower way over to my left. Further brilliant flashes in the night jump up and illuminate the edges of the mountains all around. And I can only presume that these are Alina's or Yuri's. A new voice rises up through the sound of the song. It comes from nearby. Apriola. It whispers. A sinister, serpentine voice in the shadows. Fuck, she mutters, pulling temporarily back from the weapon. Adam, there should be a pile of Bibles behind you, beside the crate. You see M. Bibles. I turn, frantic, scrabbling around the nearby crate in the darkness. Yes. I got one. Open it up and read one of the highlighted passages. You want me to what? Which one? Any one. But be quick, please. April, comes that voice again. I start in terror as it sounds like it comes from right behind us, but turning to look reveals that there is nothing there. I see what lurks in your heart. You will take this new one with you. Deliver him unto us. When the voice says us, it is as if two voices are speaking at once, one saying us, and one saying me. It makes both sounds together. I feel something caressing the side of my face. I turn, again, in a panic, but as with before, there is nothing there. The wind blows, and the night flashes. Come on Adam, April says. A little more urgently as she fires off another beam. This one, however, seems thinner than the last. Not quite so bright. A little less full of life in its energy. Right. Thumbing through the book with trembling hands I catch sight of a highlighted passage. 
and I read it aloud. The thief comes only to steal and destroy. I manage. My voice weak in the wind as the battle rages. Shadows drift and dance in the dark. A collective sense of clamoring, of scuttling and of writhing is shivering its steady way up the mountainside. Yeah, no. Try another. April shouts at me as she swings around the weapon. I desperately flick through the pages, ducking instinctively to avoid a shadowed hand reaching out towards me. But when I look for it as with before there is simply nothing there. I find another passage. When you when you go to war in your land against the ad adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with trumpets, that you may be remembered. Come on, Adam. With heart, April shouts as a circle of wind rises up between the mountains, swirling and crackling with terrible storm-like energy in the night. What the fuck is happening? But I get the message. As I said before, I'm not a particularly religious guy. I don't know if I believe in God or any of that. And I don't really know why I'm leafing through a battered old Bible on the side of a Russian mountain in the middle of the night. But we do our duty. So I roll back my shoulders and take a deep breath. I hear that whispering begin again. But I don't allow myself to listen. I project and bellow out loud into the storm. The beams flashing like lightning as the mountain comes alive with shadow and fire. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you my voice carries loud and clear through the frost-tipped air. April cannot help but shoot me a quick glance with eyebrows raised before returning to the weapon. She brings it quickly round with a clank and an arc of light is sent rippling through the night. Then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, that you may be remembered. At the word trumpets, where before I conjured in my mind something meek and modest, like a school marching band one that I might well have taken part in as a child I now see an army of golden horns, aimed up to the heavens amidst swirling dust, blasted loud and charged in their energy. The light of the beams glitters bright in the edges of my silver cross, flailing and waving in the wind. And a terrible, clambering shadow is resolutely obliterated into clattering, rattling fragments and lost to the rock of the mountainside below. And so it goes, for the longest night of my life. The hours crawl by, the shadows come and the lights flash, and it is not until the first thin slither of light appears welcomingly on the far horizon do we crash back against the crates and the walls. Up here on the outpost roof, April and I, she looks over to me, eyes bloodshot and hair streaked with sweat, sweat that will quickly freeze across her face if not wiped away. Well, there you go Adam, she says, welcome aboard. I don't respond, wearily, with grunts and grimaces. She clambers to her feet to the sound of clicking bones. She stretches her arms and turns to the left and the right, pulling down the muscles. She raises a hand to someone. Though I do not have the energy to turn and see who she's waving to. Charlie, probably, come on, she says, lowering her hand and offering it to me. I take it and allow her to help me up and we head through the doors and back down the stairs. She shows me through a corridor towards the sleeping quarters, and we pass by Yuri coming the opposite way. One of his hands shakes, and the motion draws my eye. His knuckles and fingers are all scratched, scuffed and scabbed. He stares right through us as he walks by. For a moment I think that April isn't going to say anything. Then at the last second she says, Good job, Yuri. Yuri grunts in reply, not slowing or stopping or even turning our way. I have a thousand questions, but they can wait for now. Despite the rising of the sun I am fit to crash. And so once April has shown me to my room and she's shut the door behind her, I haul off my uniform and collapse into bed. A modest little thing, but right now it feels like the most comfortable place in the world. I fall into immediate sleep. My questions are intertwined with my dreams and they are realistic and unsettling. My sleep is deep and long. I awake much later in the day. Unsure of where I am, I try to push away the nightmares of demons in the dark, only to realize that they were not nightmares at all. The wind blows beyond the windows. I groggily roll over to check the time. 15.45. I've slept about 10 or so hours straight. Impressive. I guess I really needed it. I rub my face and groan. So this is actually real. This is all happening. Ugh. I clamber out of bed and head to the sink, preparing for the new day. If you can call it a day. A handful of daylight hours left to go and then. And then what? That same hell all over again. What is this place? I arrive shortly in that wide, hexagonal room. The room I have taken to be the main one. Yuri is headed right towards me. Jaw set and cigarette between his lips. Hey, I say to him. Good work with the with the attack last night. He does not slow his pace as he strides past. But he squints and shoots me a sneer. Itty v banio. He mutters as he shoulders past me. All right then. I say to no one in particular as he heads down one of the adjacent corridors. The others are in here. April, reading a book. Charlie, tidying up a box of cards. And Alina, stood watching the sky and the mountains through one of the windows. No one is jumping up to explain this place to me. 
so I say it straight up, loudly and clearly. This place is fucked. Charlie and April glance up to me. Elena does not turn around. I feel like I've been pretty accommodating. I reply, but come on, for real, I would really, genuinely love just a brief explanation. Or something. I mean, the Bibles, the shadows, light guns, or whatever. Help me out here people. What's going on? Tell me straight. It's just a prank, mate. Charlie replies after a beat. And I stare at him. He laughs. Helena at last breaks from her position at the window and walks down the edge of the room. Adam, come see here. Tentatively. I head over. She regards me with those icy eyes. Then points to the world map. The one intersected with a series of gently waving. Looping lines. One of the lines arcs up through the United States. And she points to it. Where were you born? Adam. Somewhere along this line. Yes. I look at the map. Well, yeah. Actually. Just here. How did? We were all born on one of these lines. She points to a place in Russia. Not many born here. Harder for our government to find Russians. Americans invited as part of international agreement. There lay lines. April chimes in. Looking up and over from her book. You heard of them, Adam. People born on the ley lines have greater resistance to the supernatural. Greater resistance to the supernatural. I repeat, but, but the supernatural isn't. Real, right. There is a pause. As I said fella, just a big prank. Charlie says to himself. And he leans back in his chair. But but we're defending an outpost from. From what? Demons. I laugh nervously. But no one else joins in. Demons. Really? So, so does that confirm the existence of hell? And what? Heaven. Is God real? Is it all real? The gravity of our situation begins properly settling in for the first real time. Despite everything, my breathing shallows as the panic starts to rise. April rises from her seat and comes over to me, placing a hand on mine. Hey, Adam. It's okay. Alina shakes her head with frustration. She grimaces, and the grisly scar that crosses through the side of her lips is pulled tight. See, this is the problem with NATO soldiers who only do two weeks shift. We have to explain this over and over and over. Hey, Charlie calls out. I've been here for a month, Alina. Don't you forget it. Yes, but you are not typical, Charlie. Alina replies in her thick accent. You are crazy man. I gather myself. I'm a soldier. Got a minute. Pull yourself together. Adam, so the Russians stay for two months. Why is that? April replies before Alina has a chance to respond. Because the Russian command don't value the lives of their soldiers. Of course, Alina fumes and makes a noise of frustration. She closes her fist and marches towards us. She only takes about two steps. But it's hella intimidating. The woman is taller than myself. Russians stay for two months, she says, pointing a finger. Because our command have faith in us to do job well. Because we are reliable. Russians chosen. Americans are names picked from a hat. Hey guys, comes a new voice from behind. The accent is one I recognize immediately from my time in Barjafoss. As Norwegian, I turn to look at the voice's source. A man about Alina's age comes walking into the room. He is bundled up in fur coats, the outermost of which bears the Norwegian flag. Curls of red hair poke out from beneath his winter hat. And he approaches me at once, smiling. Hello friend, he says, taking my hand. My name is Christian. Pleasure to meet you. He jerks a thumb back in the direction he just came from. I've just come from the tower. Yuri says you did well last night. I am surprised by this. Did he? There's a pause. Christian scratches his beard. Well, no. But he didn't say anything bad about you. So you must have done pretty okay. Right. Christian walks to the nearest of the walls and straightens one of the picture frames. Taking a moment to admire the photograph within. What happened to this tradition? He says after a moment. Alina, what do you think? Maybe we should get ourselves a group pick. Alina snorts and folds her arms. No, is the quick response. Christian murmurs and scratches his beard. As if in deep thought, turning back to the photograph. So, I continue. Yeah. It's nice to meet you Christian. I'm kind of still getting brought up to speed here. This outpost, what's its purpose? Like, why do the demons want it so much? Why is it so important to defend? I think about my own question. And they are. Demons, aren't they? The shadows at night, or are they? The tone shifts, and Christian turns to me, his eyes sparkling. You may call them whatever you like. My friend, he says, but they are the enemy. And why they seek this spot exactly? We do not know. We can make guesses, though. He walks across the room to the maps, pointing first at the map of Russia, then at the map of the ley lines. You see where we are? He asks, pointing. I nod. The outpost intersects three ley lines. He says, it's an important place. This, the outpost was built upon it. We have it for one primary reason. 
so that the enemy may not. There are other such places. I should think. He points to a couple of other places across the map where multiple ley lines meet. Wait, you mean there are more outposts? I ask, bewildered. More places like this? I should think so, yes. Christian replies. There is one in Australia. This I know. Perhaps one in India. He points to three intersecting lines. Maybe others. I put my hands to my head. This is insane. This doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense. Alina says, then she sighs. Amerikanets. She mutters, flicking her eyes from me to April, before turning away. Hey now, Christian says good-naturedly. We are all friends here. Comrades in coalition are the spirit of this outpost. He pats me on the shoulder. You are very welcome here. Friend, come. I will teach you how to use the weaponry this afternoon. How the hell is this guy so cheerful? Is all I can think, as he leads me from the room and out into the cool afternoon air. Up to one of the garrison posts stationed around the outpost's roof. This one, like April's, looks out over an expanse of mist and rock, and a steep, deep drop down the mountainside. So, Christian begins with a pleasant smile. The corners of his eyes crinkle as he does so. The weapon works as follows. Crank here, turn here to move, aim with sights, you saw how it works? Yes. I nod. Yes, he continues. They are modeled after the M4. So you should be okay. The light is powerful but not all powerful. Do not hold its concentration for too long or the demons adjust to the light. So that's what they are then. They are demons. I shake my head. I just don't understand. The implications of all this. Best not to think too much about it. Christian chuckles. Think good thoughts. It really does help. He taps the side of his head. Before my time, this next little story. But according to Alina there was a Sikh guy stationed here once. He looks out over the edge. The cross did not work for him, nor the Bibles. He had a... A rough first few days. How rough? Exactly. I risk asking. Christian sighs. I do not know. According to Alina. He lost his sight, and then the next night, whilst awaiting rescue, he simply disappeared. He lost his sight. Went blind, you mean. Then, then vanished. Yes, sadly. I dwell on this. As a gust of breeze sends a shiver down my back, I follow Christian's gaze. The view really is beautiful on a clear day like this. Beautiful and terrifying in its isolation. Christian goes on. But whilst he was here, Alina tells me that the demons were different. The things they said, the things they tried. They were unusual. How so? Christian shakes his head. I cannot say. I do not know. You would have to bring the topic up with her. How long has Alina been here? Exactly. I ponder. I know that April doesn't really trust her. That much is plain. She has her suspicions about the woman. And as I said, the Bibles didn't work for him either. Christian says, they are supposed to work relatively well for the Abrahamic religions. At least, we shoot the shit for another hour. The first hour to actually go by quickly since I set off from Barjufas. He tells me about the others. And about himself. He asks questions about me and where I'm from. He really is a nice guy. He tells me that Alina is friendly once you get to know her. Which I find hard to believe. That April was worse than me on her first day here. And that Yuri believes that there is only one demon. And what we see are but puppets, or appendages of a greater whole. We talk a little longer, and we eat together as a group, a large evening meal. Though our day is really only just getting started, I am to be manning a turret on the outpost tonight. The very idea sends that ball of anxiety in my stomach back into its rapid cycle of tightening, tensing. It's a painful, physical ache that comes in quick, awful cold washes. Washes that become more frequent as the hours pass and the sun creeps lower. But one cannot stop the ticking of the clock. The shadows draw in. The wind rises. And I am find myself at my station, squinting out into the wind. You remember the duties? Christian had asked me. Yes. I had replied. And I listed them off. 5. Keep a constant presence in the tower. 4. Do not leave the outer ring of the outpost after sundown. 3. Do not use weaponry beyond the outer ring. 2. Do not engage verbally with the enemy. 1. Defend the outpost. Do not allow the enemy into the outpost. Christian had nodded. Duty 1 is the key. Adam. We defend the outpost. We do not allow the enemy into the outpost. I say it to myself now. At the edge of the mountain in the midst of the wilderness, the wastes, the vastness and the ice and the cold, there are still so many mysteries left to solve. What's at the heart of the outpost? Why do the enemy want it so badly? Is it really all just about supposed ley lines? And why would so few soldiers be stationed in so large an outpost as this? I wonder if there are still things I'm not being told, and if I can truly trust my teammates. But these questions will have to wait. Do not allow the enemy into the outpost. I murmur out loud, my fingers trembling against the sights of the weapon. 
As the sun sinks slowly below the horizon, 